The Everything Apartments podcast is provided with support from the Apartment Association of Greater Los Angeles, better known as AGLA, serving residential landlords throughout Southern California through education and advocacy. Visit aagla.org. Welcome to the Everything Apartments podcast. I'm your host, Eric Christopher. And on this podcast, we cover all topics of multifamily investments from buying and financing properties, day-to-day operations and management, and also reinvestment strategies. First, I wanted to remind some of the newer listeners, we have a whole bunch of back episodes. We started doing the podcast early in 2021. I think this is episode 22, gone on all the last year and through now this year. I encourage you to scroll back in whatever platform you're using and take a listen to some of the previous episodes. We've got some great guests like we do today and a lot of different topics that are all multifamily oriented. As you all know, the last few years since the start of the COVID era, as I'll call it, it's been a very difficult time to be a landlord. The government overreach against property owners, specifically apartment owners, has been just in a word completely ridiculous. Uh, parallel that on a side note, you know, many of you may know that LA County is considering throwing back down a mass mandate in public places where, you know, I'd be really the only one in the country or maybe one of two or three in the country. Thankfully, Long Beach isn't going to follow that lead. But, you know, we've all seen the writing on the wall. We felt it. Uh, Most of us are victims of the County of Los Angeles, and I've heard our guests talk uh, in depth much about the city of Los Angeles, which I really don't know why anybody would want to own there, uh, just based on what I've heard. But certainly the County of Los Angeles has thrown down enough of their overreach, and that affects a lot of listeners here that own properties in Long Beach and the surrounding areas. Today, we have a great guest whose name will be familiar to many of you and needs little introduction, Attorney Dennis Block. His firm, Dennis Block & Associates, has been specializing in representing landlords and evictions across the Southland for over 40 years. His website, evict123.com, is an absolutely wonderful resource to keep abreast of eviction law. He's got a column in the AGLA monthly magazine, which is one of the things that I read every month just to to keep abreast on what people are asking and what his answers are. But first I wanna tell you about our firm, WSC Realty Advisors and WSC Property Management. WSC has been helping buyers and sellers and managing properties in Long Beach for over 15 years. If you're tired of managing your units or just not getting the results you want, we can help. WSC never wants to be the biggest firm in Long Beach. Instead, we stay a little smaller and more agile to bring you the quality you want in your management. We can also help you if you're looking to acquire more units here or maybe an exchange scenario out of state to other apartments or a single tenant net leased investment or even a DST. We've got a lot of people looking at those these days. Visit wsc-pm.com. Call, text, or email us. All that information's in the show notes. Mention the Everything Apartments podcast and get your first two months of management absolutely free. Whatever your challenge with your property, WSC has the solution. Dennis, it's an honor to have you with us today. I'm a big fan and I watch you on the Agla webinars regularly. Well, thank you for having me, Eric. Uh, always enjoy uh, these types of podcasts and kind of getting the word out to landlords who really are under attack. Uh, you mentioned that uh, this is governmental overreach. Uh, it's governmental overreach on steroids, to be frank with you, in terms of uh, what's going on out there. Uh, it total degradation of property rights, certainly for the people in the city of Los Angeles, as you mentioned. It's opening up a little bit in uh, LA County. And of course, other counties are pretty much wide open. But again, uh, the assault on income property owners has been totally horrific. While the politicians certainly wanted to create legislation to protect segments of our society from truly a pandemic that was physically, mentally, and financially taking away from so many people's lives. But their position was that that financial burden should be placed right on the shoulders of landlords and why landlords have to shoulder this financial burden for their tenants is unbelievable. You know, I've I've got a partnership in a restaurant entity down here in Long Beach. And and the government was very fruitful in helping a lot of different businesses where, you know, it was very much the twilight where we started to hear about rent relief and the application process. We won't go into that because I know there's a lot of listeners out there and clients that I talk to that have applied. It's just been pending for months and months and doesn't really serve the purpose, but certainly the landlord class has been 
really left to the side. We're, we're victimized in a way that uh, a lot of the constituency of these politicians that are, are putting these, these rules and, and restrictions through on us don't consider us as a meaningful voting class. So they're catering to the tenant base. But the question is, we've had an unbelievable few years and we've had a, a multitude of these eviction moratoriums and freezes on basic property rights. We had a period just recently, and I, did, I wasn't aware of it until I, I heard you speak about it, that was running, I believe, from April to the end of June, where we could evict for failure to not self-certify for COVID uh, symptoms or COVID causes of not paying rent. So what exactly changed on July 1st and, and kind of maybe why did that happen relative to what we could do before July? Okay, well, first of all, uh, across the state, eviction moratorium basically ended as of March 31st, which means that any rent owed from April through now, July, or going into August, landlords across the state are free to pursue their normal eviction route, civil remedies to uh, take care of rent that hasn't been paid by the tenant. Now, certain cities still have their protections up, including, uh, as we mentioned, the city of Los Angeles, which is the absolute worst, mm. and also the county of Los Angeles, excluding the city of Los Angeles. In April, uh, anybody who had property in the county of Los Angeles, which excludes the city of Los Angeles, so if you had a property in Long Beach, El Segundo, Pasadena, Glendale, Burbank, if a tenant doesn't pay you the rent, then you have the right to proceed forward with an eviction for any rent owed from April 1st, 2022 forward in time. There is one exception. The tenant had to what they call self certify within the first seven days of each due date. So for example, we're in July, a tenant in order to have the uh, escape the process of an eviction would have had to communicate to the landlord within the first seven days of April, first seven days of May, June, and July, that they have an inability to pay because of COVID. If they didn't do that, then the landlord is free to serve your standard three-day notice. You don't have to apply for the rent relief and you can proceed forward with an eviction. Now, people think that somehow there's a special cutoff date when it came to July, but in July, the county made it better for landlords, not worse, better. Because in addition to the tenant having to, quote, self-certify, saying, hey, I can't pay because of COVID. And by the way, he can do that in any way. He can send you a text. He can send you an email. He can tell you. He can write you a letter. He can do smoke signals, <laughs> however he wants to do it. But he has to do it within the first seven days, or you're free to proceed forward with a non-payment of rent case for that month. Now, in July, it changed slightly. Even if you still self certify, you still can be the subject of an eviction unless you also communicate to the landlord that your income level is below the 80% of the area median income for the county of Los Angeles. So I happen to have those figures handy here. And for the county, if you're a single person, 88% 80% of the area of medium income would mean you'd have to be earning uh, $66,750 per year or less. For two family household, it would be, for example, $76,250. But the bottom line is, is that if a tenant comes to you in July and says, hey, I can't pay because of COVID, and that was between July 1 and July 7, you still can evict him because he didn't also communicate to you that, hey, by the way, I don't make that much money and I'm within the at least 80% or below of the area median income for the county of Los Angeles. So right now we are proceeding with uh, non-payment of rent cases for the county of LA, excluding, I keep emphasizing, the city 
of LA. And if we want to now go into Los Angeles, I can do that as well as to the Gestapo government as to what's <laughs> happening in uh, Los Angeles. It's too ugly to hear. I, I know that a lot of my Long Beach cohorts, property managers, owners, investors, they kind of feel the same way I do. I feel like, uh, you know, there, there, there's got to be a reason, but over the last few years here in Utah and just hearing other people that own here and there, it's a it's a snake pit of, of regulation and, and handcuffs on you. Now, let me ask you this. So they, they must come forward now in July and, and disclose that they make 80% or less of the AMI area meeting income. And also sidebar, that website where you can look at that, I'll have that in the show notes because they do have it. They have a, uh, a matrix based on how many people are, are in the home. Okay. So if we look at 65,000 or so, um, that, you know, that's not a lot of money here in LA. You go out of state somewhere and that's a, that's a good living, but, but here not. But my question around that, my long-winded question is how do we verify that? For example, if I had a tenant that came in a year and a half or two or three years ago, and he's working for ABC company and he's making 80 plus thousand dollars a year. Some of this stuff is very nebulous on how to verify it and how to act on it. Meaning if the person comes and says, oh, I make less than 80% of the AMI. Are we to take that as that's it? There's no way to verify that. Or could I build case behind him telling me two years ago, oh, I make $85,000 at ABC company. What's, what's the workaround on that? Well, remember the way the county of LA structured their law, the operative words were self-certify, self-certify. So you don't have to prove anything to anybody. All you have to do is, is state it, which is why the Apartment Association of Greater Los Angeles and also the Apartment Owners Association have brought lawsuits against the county that, uh, and there's been previous cases, certainly on the East Coast, that says that you can't have a legislation which is based on self-certifying uh, if you're going to take away property rights from another group. So they at least they would have to show it. For example, just right before I got on the phone, uh, I was talking with a client who has an elderly woman in her unit. And this uh, person it doesn't work, uh, has a little bit of an Alzheimer's problem. But the issue is she hasn't paid rent for the last few months. And the issue is, is that uh, on what basis can she say that she's financially impacted by COVID? And of course, she can't. So while it's a somewhat of a she has a grandchild, an adult grandchild living with her. Of course, he's not paying rent anyway. But the reality is, is that that's a case in Los Angeles that we're going to bring forth on the basis that uh, if it does go to court, she's going to have to, once it gets to a court of law, she is going to have to uh, put forth evidence as to on what basis she's financially impacted by Alzheimer's. She's not working. She won't work. We've seen the same thing like with pensioners who never worked for the last 20 years. They're on a pension. So how are they impacted by COVID? They might be impacted by inflation, but again, that has nothing to do with COVID. Yeah, it's a good point without going into specifics on the, the, the case that I'm in the middle of right now. It was one of those things where we were on the eve of evicting a certain tenant right before the eviction moratorium went down, like basically had the window slammed on our fingers. This person did not pay us rent for a few months before the COVID period hit. Obviously, that kind of froze us for a considerable period of time and now trying to push that through based on the fact that there, there's been no funds transferred for over two years, you know, two, almost two and a half years. So getting to, getting to the bottom of this thing is a matter of saying, okay, how can we do this? If, if, we, if we can't build a case around this person, tell us that they make less than 80% of the media income and self-certified, we know that that's probably not lawful as far as how that could be set up. But you mentioned something a minute ago, and I read a lot about this, and I was talking to, to Dan Yukelson about it, that not that long ago, I guess it was a joint action brought by AGLA and AOA to push uh, the county of LA for the, you know, this eviction moratorium being unlawful. And I never really heard anything about what happened with that. Did, did you hear what was finally disposed of that? It's still pending. It's going through the trial court level right now. Uh, it's somewhat irrelevant whatever the judge decides in this case. So I think it's clear 
that the uh, county cannot do what it's doing. But why I say it's irrelevant is because regardless of who loses, there's going to be an appeal filed. And then it'll make its way through uh, the appeals court. And who knows, it could even find itself in the Supreme Court. The issue, though, is that by the time this dust all settles, the reality is we're probably going to be out of these uh, horrific laws that are filed. There was another suit against the city of Los Angeles where I think they might be responsible for the losses that landlords are facing, certainly in the city of Los Angeles. You yourself are looking at loss of income for two years. In any other situation, you would have filed an unlawful detainer, and in a couple of months, you would have gotten your property back and found yourself a tenant who would be willing to pay the rent. But because of government intrusion with regard to uh, this pandemic and shouldering this financial responsibility on, on the landlords, you're sitting there and losing two years worth of income. We have cases where the rent is $15,000 a month, $18,000 a month. There owing the landlord over $150,000 to $200,000. In one case, I have a client who only owns a duplex in the city of Los Angeles and hasn't gotten paid since March of 2020. And he tells me, I'm going to lose my place. And we haven't discussed the city of Los Angeles. Maybe we should do that just for a second. Mm -hmm. But there's no nothing we can do in the city of Los Angeles. If the tenant says the word COVID, there's there's nothing else you can do in terms of non-payment of rent. The tenant has a buy to escape any kind of an eviction case until the moratorium is over. The moratorium is now set to be ending unless they extend it. It's set to end now in August of 2023. That's another year from today where landlords would have to go another year, another $15,000 a month, or this person with the duplex. People are not going to be able to, to hang on to this. And quite frankly, Eric, there's no one in the state of California, in my opinion, that's financially impacted by COVID right now. Maybe back in March or April of 2020, but who can't get a job now? Employers are desperate to fill their job openings and you can't do it. I'm looking for uh, legal clerks, and it's difficult for getting people to show up on an interview. The reality is, is that the politicians have created this, quote, protection, where no protection needs to be found. In the city of Los Angeles, uh, you can't evict for unauthorized occupants. You can't evict for unauthorized pets, though I do have an appeal pending, which that might change if the appeal goes our way, and I'm hoping that it will. Uh, you can't evict for non-payment of rent is and all because the tenant just has to say the word COVID. But we have been bringing forth uh, many, many, over 200 cases in the city of Los Angeles where the tenant hasn't paid the rent because I did find a small little crack in the law. And that deals with a situation where you have property in the city of Los Angeles, but it's not subject to the LA Rent Control, RSO, Rent Stabilization Ordinance. And what we do in those cases where the tenant is on a month-to-month -month tenancy is that we serve a change of terms of tenancy to increase the security deposit to two times the monthly rent. So if you've only gotten one month's rent from your tenant when they moved in, and let's pretend the rent is 4000 and let's pretend you got a $2,000 security deposit. So what we do is we serve a 30-day change of terms of tenancy to increase the security deposit to the maximum allowed by law. Law, which would be 4,000. So let me ask you this, would the increased deposit method work in the county of LA? It would if you have, but you see in the county, we can now evict for non-payment of rent. But let's pretend you had a, uh, a property that the was on a month to month and you're in the county of LA and every month like clockwork, this tenant self-certifies, he tells you he's below the 80%. So now you have no options to evict him until potentially January 1st of 2023 for the county of LA. In that case, the same plan would work where you would serve on that tenant a 30-day notice to change the terms of the tenancy to increase the security deposit to two times uh, the monthly rent. Uh, and then if the tenant doesn't pay that difference, then you have the right to evict.
Okay, so so good point there. You're you're basically circumventing the whole discussion of COVID, cell certification, 80% or less AMI, just go straight toward the deposit and, and use that as your sole purpose for, for eviction. Right, but, but don't forget the politicians are circumventing all property rights. So it is certainly a fair way to get back to what our constitutional rights are. The circumvention is really the politicians. Any way that you can enforce your property rights and stay within the law, I encourage all landlords to do so. I mean, it's really been uh, the mainstay of my motto and, and my philosophy, especially in terms of representing landlords and income property owners for the last 45 years. For sure. And I, I heard you mention on a, a couple webinars in the past, it, it was kind of funny, but also rang out as true. And a lot of people are actually pulling this off where you're, you're saying you'd be better off being in Texas or Boise or, uh, you know, Florida or Tennessee. For the people that are just grounded here, they're, they're not able to transfer their investment out of state or they just don't want to. What do you see in your crystal ball? Do we ever get back to a near normal, uh, fair environment for evictions? Because I talked to property managers over in Arizona, even just last six or nine months, I visited Tucson to look at a bunch of buildings. And I sat out with a property manager and I said, tell me about your, your eviction process. And she said, well, what do you mean? It's it's really no problem. I said, well, tell me more because we have a big problem in Southern California. She says, well, if it doesn't, if they're not out in 30 days, there's there's something wrong. But, you know, 90 percent of them, they're out in 30 days is cut and dry. So, again, going back to the question, you know, looking forward five years or, or more. Are we now in a new paradigm with this kind of thing, or do we go back to maybe more of what we had before, which is the fairness fact? Well, there is no fairness and there is no constitutional protections when it comes to income property owners. Uh, I think landlords have to be very diligent. Part of the problems are that they don't screen their tenants well. That's through the invaluable to use the services of the uh, the apartment associations to make sure you're getting a good tenant, though that doesn't guarantee that uh, a tenant isn't going to go south on you. We had uh, a case this last week. I mean, I, I never have to make up a story because we hear these stories on a daily basis where the guy showed, trying to guess how much that rent was, I think it was about $12,000. The guy showed $400,000 in a bank account uh, and was a big CEO of a company, came in, paid the first month's rent. That's it. After that, no rent. Uh, so um, we're doing that case right now. It's insane what what goes on out there. Uh, that, In fact, that property was in, in Malibu, so part of the county of LA, so we could go forward with it. But it's it's just insane. Uh, again, green your tenants well to answer your question. Uh, you guys need to make sure that you're getting the maximum rent that the law allows. Uh, your rent should always be at market level, and any rent increase that you're allowed, you should take. Uh, I have clients who haven't increased the rent in 10 years, and then they serve a simple rent increase, and the tenants are out outrage. You've got to train your tenants where even under statewide rent control, you are right now entitled to a 10% rent increase. You've got to keep your rents up to market level. If you're not sure what market level is, you can always go to Zillow. I like another website that's free, at least for the first five um, lookups, which is called Rentometer, R-E-N-T-O-M-E-T-E-R, rentometer.com. And you can check to see what other units similar to yours are in your area and what they're doing. Uh, so check in and make sure that whenever you can give a rent increase, you can. Uh, if you're not in the county of Los Angeles, if you're uh, not subject to a local jurisdiction, you will be free come January 1st. If you have low paying tenant, you can always do what they, we call a renovation eviction. And that is where you're going to uh, serve a notice to terminate on a tenant. Usually it's a 60 day notice on the basis that you want to renovate the unit. Renovation requires that it takes at least 30 days to complete and also that it requires a building permit like an electrical or plumbing permit. So basically, if you're going to redo the kitchen or redo the bathroom, you have a clear way, even though you're subject to statewide rent control, uh, to evict these tenants. If you want to get a 10% rent increase and that's good for you, great, then do that. But if you are going to evict the tenant because the rent's so low, more likely than not, you're going to have to renovate the unit anyway. So this is really a no-brainer 
that's part of the uh, statewide rent control that you can evict for uh, major renovation, as I described. Uh, the county has put a clamp on that, unfortunately, but that clamp is removed come January 1st, 20. 23. Got it. Any any screening tricks, tips that you might have heard that we aren't thinking about, kind of past the obvious that you may have heard from something that we may need to do right now to, to screen? For example, I just was thinking as we're talking, well, why don't I just require everyone that comes to me to make over 80% of AMI? Well, I think that's reasonable. Uh, but then, of course, the guy can always say two months down the line, like I lost my job. So now... <laughs> I'm in the zero percentile. So there's always ways to get around it. Generally, obviously, you got to do a, a, an exhaustive credit check through the associations, do a criminal check, do anything you can think of to make sure that, that this is a proper applicant. You want to uh, call the employer uh, to make sure that he's actually working there. We have so many cases where uh, the tenant lists these employment factors, but the landlord never called and checked. You got to call, you got to check, you want to see pay of tax returns. I try to avoid people who are self-employed because it's very easy for them to take white out to a tax return. Uh, and you want to um, get people that generally are the, in jobs that you know they're not going to leave, like the post office, like uh, the uh, school districts. These people are never going to leave these jobs. So those are ones that are highly desirable if you can get those applicants to come. Also, if a tenant uh, wants to get into your property real quick, guaranteed that tenant's being evicted. So if they if they just are so anxious, oh, I've got to get in, that's, that's a red uh, herring that they're going <laughs> to have some problems going in. So also make sure that you get uh, two months security uh, plus your first month's rent. Get the maximum security. Uh, it's it's kind of like a mini credit check. If the guy can't come up with two months security on the first month's rent, then that indicates that he doesn't have much savings. And if he doesn't have much savings, as soon as something tips him off, then the first person that he's not going to pay is uh, his landlord. So these are small things. Uh, and also watch his demeanor. Uh, see if you can walk him back to his car uh, during the application process and uh, see how his car looks filled with beer cans and garbage. <laughs> it's not just a matter of getting paid rent. You'd also like to have somebody who's going to take care of your place. Uh, That's so a when good you point. check with previous landlords, you want to say, how did he take care of the place? Did he pay his rent on time? Okay. How did he take care of the place? And uh, assuming the landlord wants to tell you, but uh, those are things that you need to investigate everything. Also check these guys on social media. Uh, you'll find so much about these people on social media uh, and what they're doing. And, you know, the guy is, is a dog breeder when he told you he had no dogs <laughs> or you just see the guys always having, you know, parties into the late night. This is going to affect your property. So definitely check them out on social media. Yeah, that's a you bring up a good point with the trying to garner as much information. I did one of the podcast episodes on this way back. And that that's the little thing you do during screening. Like if, if they live locally, go over to their drive by their house at night on a Friday or a Saturday, see what the house looks like. Is there trash and junk all over the front yard, beer cans, as you mentioned. And then what kind of, what, what kind of people are hanging out? You know, you see people hanging out, which is fine, but you can kind of get a feel for what you see there on somebody who's applied with you on where they live and how they're living their life, yeah, life just, now. Just substitute your property for that place. <laughs> and that's what you're going to get. So I've got, I've got a question now. I'm understanding in, in the County of LA that we can evict for unauthorized persons or unauthorized pets. And again, to kind of try to circumvent this excuse of uh, COVID hardship. For example, I have one lady in a building I just took over. Welcome, Eric. Here you go. Where she's behind, let's say, 5000 from this year, self-certifying. I can't pay because of COVID. Making current payments, but has the balance. But last week, I discovered she has an unauthorized pet. Also, by the way, is making a mess all over the property all the time. It's just let let out and go do your business and come back. And I'm thinking, okay, well, we don't even have to bring up the topic of the of the past due balance and the failure to pay based on COVID. I can go straight at her with an unauthorized pet eviction, correct? Absolutely. 
that would be a notice to perform or quit, have the dog vacate within three days or you'll proceed forward with an eviction. Uh, I'd also in that same notice uh, demand that she uh, clean up the uh, the property as a result of what the dog has been doing. So you almost have two, uh, two items in your notice to perform or quit. Getting back to the kind of, I'm, I'm just trying to put, pave the road for investor expectation myself moving forward. Because you, you see a lot of the government maneuvering these days and it, it you just wonder like, what really is the end game? You hear some crazy stuff coming out of Washington and from the state, really not related to real estate. It rings out similar. It's like, what are these people trying to accomplish at the end of the day by, let's say we get into next year and they say, oh, we're going to we're going to extend this eviction moratorium. They've they've effectuated what they wanted to do, and that was presumably to help the tenants through this tough time, which you and I both agree is well past us. Anybody who wants to work can. Anybody that probably wants to get a promotion probably can. I'm just kind of wondering what does three, five years look like down the road? Is rent, in, rent control further further strengthening against us? Is it? Do we have some of these eviction moratorium items that? They, they stick with us because that's kind of what the government does. Hey, we're just going to we're going to write a bond for this bridge and then it's going to be off in a year and a half and it never comes back off. What right. are your thoughts on that as we kind of close I, up I think here? in this in this particular state, uh, it, whatever they can do to gather favors with tenants, obviously there's more tenants than there are income property owners and you see the spread of uh rent control everywhere. Well, first of all, rent control is everywhere in the state of California because there's statewide rent control. But you see cities like Long Beach, uh, Culver City, Inglewood. These are all new new places. Uh, Santa Ana, Orange mm-hmm. County, conservative Orange County. Uh, Pasadena is now threatening it. Again, the smart money is to get out of Dodge. But if that's not what you want to do, uh, the, the concept is if your rents are high, okay, assuming we can do evictions, if your rents are high or at market level, they can hurt you. And that's why months and months before the onslaught of statewide rent control, we were advising everybody to raise your rents to market level. Once you're at market level, you're okay, Mm -hmm. even with the paltry uh, increases that they're giving to you. So that's my advice. Get into a place where you know for example, maybe I'm going to buy a place uh, in to then institute our renovation evictions. And once your rents are at market level, then you're somewhat shielded from the evils of rent control. Yeah, one of the one of the only positives of this inflationary environment we're at, because not a long time ago, the CPI was three and change. And now it's blown the roof off to where, you know, I think we cap out at that rent, that uh, rent increase at 10%. But get it done now, right? If you have those lagger tenants that, you know, maybe some of them have been with you a long time. We all have those. And our notion, because this is kind of a sidebar, is there was already kind of rent control based on landlord operations. Hey, this person's been a great tenant for a long time. I'm not going to raise their rent. That charity was already built into the market, but we're being penalized for that now. So as, as Dennis mentioned, get your rent increases done to the maximum extent you can. Vacancy now, where we used to kind of fear it, oh, we don't have a vacant unit. Vacancy is your friend now, believe it or not, because now you have full leniency to do whatever you want with that property. Rent it back as is, fix it up to the nines and get the absolute highest rent. And right now, with this inflationary environment we do have, you can raise the rent 10%. And usually I talk to landlords, they're not going to really on a routine basis with an existing tenant, raise it probably more than 10%. So get out there, do those rent increases, get yourself up to speed so that the rent control, as it may squeeze you further, depending on what city you're in or what county you're in, it's not going to, it's not going to be as big of a hit moving forward. And oh, by the way, the value of your building is directly tied to that income. Uh, Dennis, it's been great having you today. Let's leave it there. I really appreciate you being on here with us today. I'll have all your information in the show notes. Dennis's website is evict123.com. I highly encourage you to visit that site. Okay, well, you can easily see Dennis. He's a regular on the Agla webinars that you see uh, probably popping through your email. Certainly, if you're a, an Agla member, you do see that. Dennis, just again, a pleasure. I learn something new every time I, I talk with you or, or listen to you talk, I should say. Wish you further luck. I'm pretty sure you're going to have a busy couple of years in front of you. All right. You take care. Nice talking with you. Thank you for listening to the Everything Apartments podcast. I'm your host, Eric Christopher. Stay tuned for another episode coming soon.